joining us. Thank you. Good morning, Judge Starr. Um, welcome to Oviedo. Welcome to Buda. Um, as you know, my name is Amanda Carl. I am Vice Chair of the 5th District, uh, the 5th DCA Judicial Nominating Commission. I'm getting some time today. Um, since this is your first time in front of us, I'll go ahead and give you the spiel of what we do. We're all going to go around and introduce ourselves. You'll have two minutes. If you wish to make any opening remarks, we'll fire away with questions, and then we'll reserve about a minute at the end if you would like to make any closing remarks. As you may have noticed, we have a camera. Volusia Exposed is here recording you. Okay. Give me your good side. <laughs> <laughs> and we will go ahead. Craig, do you want to get started? Uh, Craig Geyer, Public Defender's Office, Dick Tone Beach. Good morning, Your Honor. Pedro Brownlee, Brownlee Law Firm. Good morning. Brent Brent, Hi. Chefs and Bell Rowling. Andy Bardos with Gray Robinson Law Firm. Good morning, Your Honor. Ben Citro from the Law Offices of Horowitz and Citro here in Atlanta. Hi. And I'm David Diarmas of Craig McPrice and Diarmas. All right, well, um, good morning. My name is Liz Starr, and uh, I want to thank you for your service on this committee, especially this week. Um, I want to take this opportunity to share with you who I am. I am a first-generation Italian-American. My parents came to this country in the pursuit of the American dream. I was born and raised in Queens, New York. My father worked in a factory. My mother worked as a secretary in New York City. And when I was a little girl, my father used to tell me about what it was like when he was a little boy growing up in a dictatorship in, under Mussolini. So I was raised with my brothers with a great, tremendous respect for our system of government and in a great appreciation for the opportunities that this country provided for us, like education. And so I graduated with a double major in economics and business management, went to work for a huge investment banking firm. Needless to say, my parents were very proud of me, and I was very unhappy. I didn't like it. I thought it was a very empty, purposeless job. And so I decided I was going to go to law school and work for the government because in my mind, I believe that was a noteworthy, um, really respectable way I could contribute to our society. And so I went to law school, and 20 years later, I have been in public service my whole career. My first job as a prosecutor in Miami, I walked into the courtroom, and my impression was it was chaotic. And the statute books were the only thing that brought order. And so I learned to rely on the law and use the law to stay any ensuing chaos. And so from that moment on, I relied on the law as my guide and my shield. And so now, as a trial lawyer, a trial judge, I read the uh, jury instructions at the end of my criminal cases, and it says, even if you do not like the laws, you must use them. For over two centuries, we have lived under the Constitution and the law. No one has the right to violate the rules that we all share. And so I get a lump in my throat at the end of every trial, every time I read that last instruction, because I believe in deference to the law. I believe in deference to our separate branches of government. I believe that we should hold our system of government accountable. So where a person votes for their representative and they write the law and there's an executive that's chosen that enforces the law, I don't believe that it's the judiciary's role to say what the law ought to be or act as an oracle of sorts. And so I hope that the time we have today um, allows me to share and convey those beliefs to you, um, and that I can convey uh, my commitment to the rule of law. Thank you. I will begin. I had the opportunity to vet you, and uh, everybody I spoke with, as you might imagine, spoke very highly, and um, just really was very interesting, since you and I had not met before, uh, to, to talk to people that I, that I do know and respect uh, who had comments. Um, that having been said, I have kind of two rather unrelated questions. The first one, just 
may or may not shed any light, but how do you end up from New York to Miami and then Orlando? So um, I I got a job as a prosecutor. I was I went to New York Law School, and I got a job as a prosecutor in Miami, and I knew it was a very reputable job. It was one of the top five prosecuting firms in the whole country, and it was a blessing and opportunity that I could not say no to. I just, they, you know, on campus interview. And so I packed up everything that I owned in a U-Haul and went to Miami for the first time in my entire life. I had been to Sicily, <laughs> but not Miami. I, I remember being confused. I didn't understand the hyphen, the Miami hyphen date. I didn't understand all the different police departments. I just, but I did it. I had to have the courage and do it. There to here. So then I met my husband in Miami. My husband a, was a prosecutor too. So we, that's a cute story. We met, we were assigned to the same judge, and then three years later that judge married us. Uh -huh. And so he got a job at a law firm in Orlando. We were planning on going back home, or at least we were going to be called, they call, they're called halfbacks. You go halfway back, like you end up in North Carolina or <laughs> Virginia. You don't go all the way back. Yeah, cool. yeah there's a name for them. Okay. Um, so my husband said, I got this great job in Orlando. It's on the way. It's not halfway. Oh, it's on it's the on way. way. So that's it. That's basically it. And then unrelated to that, you may not have much experience with that, but the, the PCA process is something that gets a lot of discussion among uh, litigators and, and people who handle appeals. Um, as a member of the board to be uh, appointed to the fifth, what's your view on PCAs? Are they overused or underused? I, I'm a more of a minimal, minimalist, less is more, um, like the Rolling Stones, sometimes you don't get what you want, but you get what you need, kind of. So, it first of all, it depends, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the PCA. I don't think we, we need to, you know, sometimes when you're the captain of a big ship, it is equally as important to keep the wheel straight and not move as it is to move, you know, depending on the tides and the wind, and sometimes it's equally as important just to stay. So I hope that answers your question. What about the second part of this question? Do you think that they're being used in an appropriate way right now? I, I, I wouldn't be able, I haven't read every single order, I wouldn't be able to tell you how they're being used now. That's true, not being able to know. Yeah, I mean, I've been PCA. It's not so bad. Right. <laughs> so have I. It ain't so good. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions for you, Judge. Um, one, when we send up our list of, of individuals, do you believe that all of the individuals on that list need to have judicial experience? No. Okay, why? I think it depends. I think the most important thing is their judicial philosophy um, and how they approach uh, the, the job um, and how, how their work ethic, um, their judicial restraint, and their appreciation for how government works. And I don't think that means that you need any judicial experience at all, or, or 30 years of experience. Um, what's the longest you've taken as a judge to issue a ruling on a motion or after? A week. Okay. So you never a, filled out that 60-day form? Never. <laughs> never. It's, it's against my personality. Um, but I do, I will tell you, um, ma making decisions, 99% of them I make, or I'd say 95% of them I make right. I mean, if I counted every decision I make, it's probably 99%. But that's one of the reasons why this is so appealing to me, this opportunity is so appealing to me, because I love making the decisions. It's something, I, it's one of the most fun things I get to do as a trial judge. But I would be lying if I said it wasn't uh, very um, dreamy or luxurious to think I would have so much time to prepare and analyze an issue. Like, that's not how it works. So, you know, there's been so many times where I've been in trial and I've made a ruling and, you know, you just have to do it. And it's exhilarating, but then after the trial, I would go and research just to, you know, just to see, like, let's make sure. And 
I think that time to actually research and analyze and get through and precise and, and make an opinion that's precise and clear, um, I think that would be luxurious. <laughs> So I'm, I'm curious, uh, having looked at your, your background in the state uh, attorney general's office, how many of your civil RICO, and I'm not including the civil RICO forfeiture ones, but the substantive civil RICO and FDUPTA cases, did you try to revert it? I tried the same civil RICO forfeiture case to revert it twice. It was hung the first time, and then I tried it again. And then on page 27, uh, you talked about your experience working with adversaries from the nation's top law firms, which we'll assume includes Gray Robinson and Shutz and Bowen for the purposes of today's discussion. But what the Bradley Law Firm. Of course, the Bradley Law Firm, of course. Uh, it, it, uh, and I won't include mine since I wasn't in private practice then. But but who were the nation's top firms and the you were referring yeah, to? Yeah, to be honest with you, I don't remember the names of them, but I remember um, they were phenomenal lawyers from New York, um, phenomenal lawyers from Florida. Um, Oftentimes, you know, those cases were huge, and they, you know, some of them were legitimate. Most of them were legitimate companies, big multi-million-dollar, um, you know, uh, Forbes types of companies, uh, and they had tremendous lawyers. And so it wasn't necessarily where they came from, but it was their caliber of um, of lawyering. They were they were incredible litigators, um, sharp as anything I've ever seen. And so that's what I describe, and that's a tremendous opportunity to not only handle those types of cases and speak with one voice for three different attorney generals and be responsible for these multi-million dollar cases and representing, you know, one of the intensely politically media covered attorney generals, all of them, you know, and then f and make sure I was right, you know, because you can't be wrong. <laughs> like you can't be wrong. Um, so that's what it, that was about. It was amazing. It was a tremendous experience. And it, I, I hope it made me a better person and a better lawyer. So while we're on that subject, uh, Gray Robinson represents a number of companies and has over the years in H H E consumer protection cases. And uh, not speaking for anyone in particular, but I've, I've heard a concern expressed sometimes at the AG's office even when, sometimes when the, the, it's weak on the merits, case is weak on the merits, they'll try to enforce a settlement where the company then has to pay a certain amount of money and it becomes somewhat of a profit-making venture from the AG's office. And so, uh, and not to say that yeah. you were ever involved or your office was ever yeah. involved in that because we're, we tend to work in it, I think you were in Orlando and, and mm -hmm. that was, these concerns came from elsewhere, but how do you evaluate your case and how do you do it when you're in government and you're expected to be Neutral, and, you, and so it's not you know two private parties against one another. How do you ensure that well, you're not? We're not we're not neutral. We're not neutral. Um, we infor we enforce the productive statutes, and so that was our job. And just like um, I mean, it was always a measure of resources. And just like a police officer can't arrest every single drug dealer on every corner, nor can the attorney general take every single case and address every single complaint. Although, I will tell you, uh, we worked very hard. Uh, a lot of the resources we spent were processing consumer complaints um, and making sure that whatever issues were happening to the citizens in Florida were addressed, even if it was just getting a refund. So there was a lot of things very much uh, like a, you know you representing your clients and having your clients avoid having actions brought against them a lot of work on the on the beginning that nobody sees uh, as far as addressing ca bringing cases forward so much work gets done before that time that by the time we get to a situation where we need to address either address the company officially either with an assurance of voluntary compliance or a litigation we are so beyond um, we are so beyond uh, any type of amicable, amicable resolution. So I don't see it the way you see it, and I'm not saying that's not true. I'm not saying that there are there were other divisions or other individuals with um, different types of personalities that might have used that kind of strategy for whatever reason. 
Um, but that never happened with me. I ran the entire team in Central Florida. I was a bureau chief for over a decade. Um, we, we always spoke with one voice. That was the Attorney General's voice. Um, and you know, we, we contributed. We gave our opinions on who we should go uh, enforce um, cases against and where our resources were best um, used for the protection of the community and for a level playing field for businesses. Um, I loved it. I took it very seriously. I took the purpose of the job very seriously. But at the end of the day, uh, I didn't make the final decisions. We made the decisions with the approval of the deputies and the attorney generals. And then we spoke with one voice. So of those cases, how many involve Cypre settlements as opposed to refunds to the citizens of Florida, the individual citizens, percentage-wise? Yeah, most of mine were not Cypre. Most of mine were refunds. Um, maybe that's because that's what I was passionate about. Um, the side prey were generally areas, I think, that were less litigation uh, sort of d direction, but they were not in the, all the cases are litigation, but there were some that you knew weren't gonna be litigation cases. I'm a litigator, I don't know any other way, so all my cases, you were either gonna resolve the case with me or we were going to litigate, and those types of cases involve refunds to com to consumers. So, sure, no, no, sure. Yeah. So if there's an investigation and, and the investigation reveals that perhaps the case is not as strong as you thought it was, and I, you didn't have that experience. No. Okay. No, I didn't. Okay. No, I if. When you say case is not as strong, I immediately say, can I prove the case by a preponderance? Is this something that we should devote resources to? Um, is there a value in uh, putting up this battle to protect the citizens of Florida and citizens across the United States? I, if, so when you get a case at the Attorney General's office, you begin the investigation at the same time. So you have a lot of time to investigate. By the time we got to a point where um, a case was, I never got to the point where I was worried about my evidence or whether I could prove the case because the cases that we brought were so egregious or so the consumer complaints <coughs> were, were so voluminous that it was no doubt. It was really more of how are we going to satisfy everybody? How can we um, if, uh, bring this legitimate company back onto the right side of the of FDUPTA, allow them to continue to prosper and provide um, an economic product, and uh, make these consumers somewhat whole. That was my, it was always a balance of those things. So I, that, that was not an experience I had. Okay. Judge, you touched a little bit on your um, judicial philosophy and how the law is what governs, and we look to the law, um, and we uphold the rule of law. And I'm wondering um, how you see the role of stare decisis in all that. Well, generally speaking, um, it is important. Um, it's important not to rock the apple cart, and it has its purpose for the same reasons following the law has its purpose, to avoid chaos and anarchy and all those horrible <coughs> things that happen when we don't have any trust in the system. So uh, generally speaking, um, obviously it's very important. Now, uh, life evolves, society evolves, new laws are passed. Um, sometimes it could potentially be a case of telephone where we had one case that wasn't intended to be this cornerstone dramatic case and even at the time you might even interview the judges that wrote that one opinion 20 years ago and they would tell you they had no idea that that was going to be a slippery slope of decisions that changed the the landscape of business or whatever the applicable um, area of law was um, and sometimes there might be a need to kind of nudge back as little, maybe a little bit at a time, just as it nudged forward the 20 years before. Maybe it is a situation where the case law is wrong and 
um, correcting it wouldn't jolt the system. So it depends. So my answer is it depends. But those are the kind of examples that I think uh, would be exceptions to following. Thank you. It looks like we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much. Again, thank you I uh, just want to say thank you again. It was um, an honor and pleasure to uh, see you all today and meet, new, meet some new faces. Um, and I want to thank you so much for all your service and time to this whole process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Happy, new Happy, new Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Appreciate it, Daniela? No, not anymore. Okay. <laughs>